Okay, I am picking up on page 572, skincare treatments, makeup essentials. Prepare the makeup station and supplies for clients. I will say right now that this chapter is very, very lengthy and there are not, if I remember, one or two questions about makeup on the state boards and much of it, many of us already know because makeup is one thing that we've all dealt with for many years before we go to aesthetic school. So I will not be reading the entirety of this ch chapter. I will read the bold print. I will explain everything as I move through it. I'm not gonna read lists. Um, people have expressed that they would really like me to finish up chapter 13 and I would agree. I think that's a much more important chapter to uh, listen to and to study. There's gonna be more of that on your state board exams. And um, obviously there's gonna be more information in chapter 13 that you haven't been exposed to, whereas you have been exposed to makeup. So um, I'm not saying it's not important. Go back and reread it if you feel like what I talk about you need more in depth. Um, but I am going to try to quickly get through chapter 12 so that we can move forward with chapter 13. And then, as I've stated before, if I get enough followers, then I will go back and make study materials for each chapter. But this is pretty time consuming for me as a new business owner to go back and read these chapters, which I also find helpful um, just as refreshers for me. I've been in business for less than a year, um, but I will, as I complete the reading and the questions for each chapter, uh, talk more about how I started my own business and I am doing really well. So I feel like I have a lot to share. Um, so I will go ahead and get started with chapter 12, prepare the makeup station and supplies for clients. Before you begin any makeup service, you will need the necessary products, tools, and supplies to prepare your makeup kit and work area for your client. Supplies and accessories. There are many supplies and accessories that you will find useful for your makeup applications. Figure 12-26, table 12-4. These supplies may include. All right, and figure 12-26 is just someone um, touching their supplies laid out nicely on their counter. And then table 12-4 is just a very large list of makeup supplies checklist. So I'm gonna go through and again, I'm just going to read the word. I'm not gonna read what they're all used for. Um, go back and reread it if you think that you need to. So for supplies and accessories, we have sponges, spatulas, tissues, and a little more on 12-4, there lists equipment, skincare products, and makeup products in that list. So go back and read that, but I'm gonna continue on with supplies and accessories. You'll also need a wand, brow comb, lash comb, cotton swabs, paper drapes, cleaning agents, and brushes. Lash curler, hair clips or headband, cape, tweezers, sharpeners, mirror, and mixing cups. Okay, I will read the caution, it says, for a brush to be able to be disinfected, it must be synthetic, not natural bristles. Most expensive brushes are natural bristle and therefore not able to be disinfected. The safe, safest method for application is to remove a portion of the product to the palette to work from, then clean, disinfect any synthetic brushes and discard disposable brushes. I would guess on the state board that there would be a cleaning question in regard to makeup. And if I remember, there was like one random question about face shape or something. Um, but don't quote me on that. It was a one, one off question. Um, on page 575, it says, did you know perm papers make great inexpensive blotting papers for oily skin? These items can be found at any beauty supply house. It says use a makeup palette. 
Using a makeup palette is essentially for cleanliness. You disperse the makeup onto the palette so you're not dipping back into the makeup palette and you don't have to worry about disinfecting the palette because you haven't um, cross-contaminated in any way. Makeup brushes. Of course, we know makeup brushes come in so many different shapes and sizes and they can be made of natural or synthetic materials. And the next couple of pages just goes through the different brush shapes, what they look like, the type of brush that they are, what they're called, and the description for use. So again, please go back and look over the brushes so you know what shapes to use for um, each application. Uh, it goes through and tells you how to care for the makeup brushes, how to clean, how to disinfect, and I'll ask these questions. If you think you know them, then you would be ready to move on. Question 10 for check-in. Again, I just briefly went over that chapter. Uh, excluding makeup, list the supplies and accessories necessary for makeup application. So what do you think you need to prepare for a makeup application? And what are the types of makeup brushes and what is each kind used for and how should they be cared for? If you think you know the answers to those questions, then you are ready to move on. Okay, I am going to read through the infection control requirements for makeup services. So it says, following proper infection control is important to keep you and your clients safe. Check your local regulations for proper makeup product and brush, in, brush rules for makeup product and service. These safety measures should be followed when applying makeup to avoid product contamination. Wash your hands before touching or applying makeup. Do not touch product contents with your fingers as this can spread bacteria from your skin causing contamination. Do not touch open products with previously used applicators. This is called double dipping and can spread infection. Remove products with disposable single-use spatulas and distribute onto clean palettes before applying. When using pressed powder, scrape powder with a clean spatula onto a clean palette or clean tissue before applying. Never apply lipstick, gloss, or eyebrow colors directly to the client from the container or tube. Use a spatula to remove the product and then apply with a disposable applicator. Never apply mascara directly to the lashes from the container. Use a disposable mascara wand to remove the product, then apply with a new wand. If the product is accidentally contaminated, follow your supervisor's directions to either throw away the product or give it to the client. Do not put it back with a clean product to reuse. To clean multi-use applicators, pencils, and testers, follow these guidelines. For applicators, use a new or disinfected applicator, brush, wands, or spatula to distribute products. Disinfect multi-use tools after each use. Do not double dip dirty spatulas, wands, or brushes back onto products. Discard a single-use applicator such as a sponge tip as these are porous and cannot be disinfected. Sorry, my light is going out. This ring light I bought from Amazon didn't even last for four months. Okay, Pencils. Sharpen pencils and wipe with tissue. If they cannot be sharpened, they cannot be cleaned. Pencils with auto rollers or felt tips cannot be sharpened and should never be used on a client. Sharpeners must be cleaned and disinfected after each use, ensuring that all products product is removed and the blade is disinfected. Testers. Keep testers clean in a retail area. To avoid contamination, assist clients who are using testers. Using fingers and double dipping applicators will spread contamination and can cause disease. Any contaminated makeup should be removed as a tester and discarded. Palettes and supplies. Clean and disinfect artist trays, palettes, brushes, sharpeners, and foundation mixing cups after each use. Uh, another tip for the mascara wand, I think that I, I don't know where I heard this, but you can cut the wand portion off of your mascara tube. That way you don't accidentally use the wand and then contaminate your whole tube if that's the tube that you use for clients. And then there's no mistaking it. You will not use the applicator uh, wand 
brush that comes with the mascara because it's not accessible. So just cut that off and then you'll know that you need to use the um, single use uh, mascara wand. Check in question 12, list at least five safety measures that should be followed when applying makeup to avoid product contamination. contamination. Okay, and now conduct a thorough makeup consultation with the client. The client consultation is a valuable tool for both you and the client. It allows you to spend time with your client and get to know their likes and dislikes before you begin. If possible, sit down with your client and help them fill out the client questionnaire as in table 12-6. This will help you to better understand your client's needs and review their information before you begin the makeup session. Your client will appreciate that you are taking the time to work through the form with them, answering any questions they may have. Some common questions to ask during the consultation are, what are some of your needs or expectations today? Will you be attending a special occasion? Describe your makeup use. How much time do you spend applying makeup? What areas of concerns would you like to focus on? What are your favorite colors? Do you have any makeup issues, allergies, or irritations? Even though some of the questions listed above will be covered in the questionnaire, it's always a good idea to initiate a conversation with your client. The consultation will help to establish the parameters of work you can perform for them. Knowledge of prior illnesses, injuries, surgeries, or even whether the client wears contact lenses is useful to determine best practices for the makeup application you are planning. Once you have completed the client consultation form, you can add client preferences such as noting colors they prefer during the makeup application on the client chart, table 12-7. So on page 580, we have table 12-6 that they referred to on the last page that says confidential makeup questionnaire. And it just goes through some of those questions that we discussed. Um, and I would think pictures of what they are hoping for would also be something good to look at. Um, I, most people are gonna come in with a photo or a really solid idea of what they want. And in looking at that picture, you'll be able to determine if that's something that you can do for them or what you might need to discuss so they have realistic expectations. Um, table 12-7 is the client chart where you can make notes on the different colors and makeup um, products that you're using on the client. Okay, we're on page 582, and I'm gonna read the box that says, focus on makeup choices and self-confidence. Makeup can give people a lift and make them feel more attractive, thereby enhancing their self-esteem, even during the most difficult times of their lives. When working with cancer patients, makeup artists can help achieve this boost of self-confidence by focusing on their natural beauty. Always be sure to ask the clients to share their personal preferences with makeup so you can gain some insight into what look they will give them a lift and help them feel more attractive. Okay, on page 583, I'm gonna go ahead and read the did you know. For a smoother makeup application, remember to ask clients to exfoliate their skin to remove dead skin cells and prepare the face for product application before their appointment. Okay, so on page 582, we have the makeup station and consultation area, and then we have makeup lessons versus makeup application. Okay, I will go ahead and read those sections. The makeup station and consultation area. Try to have your makeup station in a visible yet semi-private area in the salon. Make sure that your makeup kit and station are cleaned and well organized before and after each client, figure 12-28. Having good visual references at hand is also suggested as you discuss makeup styles with your client. This will help to identify the desired look. Have on hand makeup examples to reference with your clients for inspiration such as current magazines or digital images. Be sure to update your references on a regular basis to keep current and inspired. Lighting. Adequate and flattering lighting is essential for makeup application. Indirect natural daylight from a large window can be good at the right time of day, but will be much more blue on a cloudy day and a clear day and will shift toward orange at sunset. Because of this variability, even this, a space with window light can need reliable, constant artificial light. A bright, even frontal light source with a daylight color balance is ideal. Placing vertical strips of light on both sides of the makeup mirror and a horizontal strip 
or row just above the mirror will produce consistent light. These lights can be rows of individual bulbs or fluorescent tubes. Fluorescent tubes consume very little power and radiate far less heat than conventional bulbs, but for makeup work, they must be daylight color balanced tubes. Traditional incandescent bulbs are inexpensive to purchase and are available in daylight color temperatures, but they produce the most heat. LED bulbs are available in daylight color temperatures and radiate much less heat than conventional bulbs. While they are more expensive to purchase than incandescent bulbs, they will save you money over time with their extremely low power consumption and life long life. The lights around the makeup mirror should be the brightest light source in the room or area. If glare from overhead lights or behind the client are brighter, look for a way to turn off or block the light. Makeup lessons versus makeup application. A makeup lesson includes instructions in how to duplicate the techniques you are using on the client as you work. Allow adequate time when scheduling the service so you can answer questions and let your clients practice the techniques on themselves. In contrast, a makeup application is one where you apply the makeup, usually for an event, and the client is not given step-by-step -step instructions. Clients will usually ask questions while you do their makeup, and you should certainly do your best to provide useful perspective and commentary as time permits, but without slowing down the makeup application process. In cases where the client has a real desire to learn the techniques you're using, you should invite the client back for a scheduled makeup lesson. Check-in. List five makeup questions you should ask your client during the makeup consultation. Okay, so you could refer back to that questionnaire if you're not sure what questions you should be asking. Okay, carrying on on page 583, perform makeup application techniques. Now that you understand the many facts of selecting preferred colors for your client, let's take a look at application techniques for each product. Foundation application. When correctly applied, foundation creates an even canvas for the rest of the makeup application. Skin tone determines the selection of foundation color as previously discussed. Skin tones are generally classified as light, medium, dark undertones are warm, cool, or natural, or neutral. Warm tones have yellow undertones, cool tones have blue undertones, and neutral skin has equal amounts of warm and cool. Matching and blending. Foundations should always be matched as closely as possible to actual skin color. If the foundation color is too light, it will have a chalky or ghostly appearance and it will sit on top of the skin. If the color is too dark, it will look dirty or artificial on the skin. The best way to determine the correct foundation color for your clients is to apply one to two inch vertical strip of color below the cheek down onto the jawline, blending slightly and then try other colors if necessary. The color that disappears and blends in is the correct one. Avoid creating a contrast between the color of the face and the color of the neck. Makeup should blend smoothly with no visible line, no line of demarcation. Different colors can be mixed together to custom blend a color. Base makeup colors may need to be changed with the seasons and sun exposure darker in the summer and lighter in the winter. Supplies for foundation application. Foundations are applied to the face with a disposable makeup sponge or brush. Sponges are banned in some states, so be sure to consult with your local regulatory agency. The sponge can be moist or dry. Padding, also called stippling, rather than rubbing, gives better coverage where it is needed. For corrective makeup applications, stippling is a technique that creates the illusion of texture on the skin where there is none. To avoid excessive rubbing and use gentle pressure while blending, primers underneath makeup help the product to go on smoother and stay longer. Concealer application. In most cases, concealer should match the tone of the foundation. You can apply this under or over the foundation beneath the eyes on other areas to conceal. Concealer is removed from the container with a spatula and may be applied with a concealer brush or sponge. Place it sparingly over blemishes or areas of discoloration and blend. It is important to match concealer color to skin color as closely as possible. Concealer that is noticeably lighter on the skin can appear obvious and can actually draw attention to the problem areas such as dark circles. If covering a blemish, match skin tone closely to avoid highlighting the blemish. Yellow or green tone concealers must be well blended and covered with foundation. The principles that apply to choosing foundation colors also apply to concealer colors. Concealer may be worn alone without foundation if chosen and blend correctly. Be sure to use it sparingly and soften the edges so that the complexion looks natural. 
Concealer products can also be used as a highlighter if the concealer is lighter than the skin color to accentuate or bring out features. A darker shade of concealer can be used for contouring. Light shades bring out features and dark shades cause them to recede. Highlighting and shading. Highlighters lighter than the skin color can be can accentuate and bring out features such as the brow bone under the eyebrow or temples, chin, and cheekbones. Contouring colors are darker shades that can be used to define cheekbones and make features appear smaller. Dark colors recede and diminish features. These highlighting and contouring or shading products are found in both liquid and powder forms. Depending on placement, these are applied in a variety of ways similar to shadow, blush, or concealer applications. Okay, I'm gonna read all the boxes on these pages and then jump back to face powder application. So, did you know, if you first hold a few colors of a palette up next to the client's face, it will give you an idea of whether the colors would be a good potential choice. This is especially useful for foundations, eyeshadows, and blushes. Okay, did you know on 585, if you feel you have applied too much powder, use a water dampened sponge to lift off the excess product. Alternatively, you can spritz the face with water using an automizer spray bottle. This will cut the dry look and without affecting the makeup. Okay, face powder application. Face powder should match the natural tone and the foundation. Translucent powder, which is colorless or sheer, blends with all foundations and will not change color when applied. Powder sets the foundation and finishes the makeup. This is usually applied after the foundation and before the rest of the makeup. It is also applied again after the blush to help blend and set the blush. Do not use too much powder as it will make the skin appear dry and draw attention to wrinkles. Make sure the client's eyes are closed to avoid getting powder in the eyes. Apply face powder using a brush. Use a brush to blend and remove the excess powder to apply sweep in circular or downward motions. Depending on the client, you can recommend both loose and pressed powders when suggested products, when suggesting products to, cl to a client. Loose powder makeup application. Loose powder products are easy to spill. Tap jars before opening to settle the product and make and take out only a tiny amount. A little goes a long way to use. A partial Brushful of product is usually more than enough. Use a clean brush or new single-use disposable spatula to remove product from the container and tap the product onto a palette to use. Replace the cap right away to avoid spillage and keep the product clean. Pressed powder makeup application. Pressed powder is compact and easy to carry for quick touch-ups during the day. Press products can be turned into loose powder by loosening it up with a new single-use spatula or disinfected or new brush. This is the faster way to remove more of the pressed product out onto the container. Blush application in figure 1229, it shows someone doing a blush application on a client. Blush gives color to the face and accentuates cheekbones. Choose a color that resembles the face when blushing. In most cases, that is pink to a red tone, adjust for skin color. Apply blush just below the cheekbones, blending on top of the bone toward the top of the cheek. When you want to get the most flattering placement of the blush to accentuate the client's cheekbones, ask the client to tilt their head back on the axis of the occipital neck bone, neck point. Notice how their cheekbones become more noticeable, then slowly turn the client's head left to right. Now you have a better idea for placement. The blush domain area is no closer to the nostrils than the center of the pupil and no lower on the jawbone than an imaginary line from the tip of the nose to the middle of the ear. And the blush gently kisses the temple area but does not reach the hairline in that region. Depending on the formulation, blush is usually applied with a brush. Creams are applied with a stiff brush or sponges, blending the color along the cheekbone so that it fades softly into the foundation. Keep blush placement away from the nose and below the temples. All right, eyebrow or eyeshadow application. And before I do that, I'm gonna read all the boxes on page 586 and 587. Did you know, when choosing powder and blush products, remember the golden rule, powder on powder, cream on cream. Caution, be guided by your state on whether bracing is required for your 
practical exam. Some artists make small precise lines when applying eyeliner, eye or lip makeup in lieu of bracing. Uh, yes, you should always brace your client when you're doing anything on their face. Uh, caution, according to the American Medical Association, eye pencil should not be used to color the inner rim of the eyes. Doing so can lead to infection of the tear duct, causing tearing, blurring of vision, and permanent pigmentation of the mucous membrane lining the inside of the eye. I know that this is honestly a common practice and makeup chips often say to do that, but I will say as a professional makeup artist, the products that you're doing that with almost always say to not do that. So if your client has irritation or any issues because you've done that and sues you, you will not be covered because that makeup said to not do something that you have now done. So while it might not seem like a big deal, always follow state regulations and the instructions on the products that you're using, whether it's skincare or makeup. Okay, eyeshadow application. Choose colors to bring out the eyes, even if the application is subtle. When applied to the lids, eyeshadow makes the eye appear brighter and more expressive. Using color other than the eye color can, can enhance the eyes. Using light and dark contrasts also brings attention to the eyes. Generally, a darker shade of eyeshadow makes the natural color of the iris appear lighter, while the lighter shade makes the iris appear deeper. The only set of rules for selecting eye makeup colors are that they should enhance the client's eyes and color choices should be flattering. Blending is the key, especially when using dark colors. Eyeshadow colors are generally referred to as highlighters, bases, and con contour or dark colors. And figure 1230 they're referring to is just someone doing an eyeshadow application. A highlight color is lighter than the client's skin tone. Popular skin color. Popular choices include matte or iridescent, which is shiny. These colors highlight a specific area such as the brow bone. A lighter color such as white will make an area appear larger. A base color is generally a medium tone that is close to the client's skin color. This color is used to even out the skin tone of the eye. It is often applied all over the lid and brow bone from lash to brow before applying other colors thus providing a smooth surface for the blending of the other colors. If used in this way, a matte finish is preferred. A contour color is deeper and darker than the client's skin color. It is applied to minimize specific areas to create contour in a crease or to define the eyelash line. Note, eye makeup primers can be used prior to applying eye makeup to help it last longer and produce truer colors. Bracing during application. Bracing takes practice, but it is a technique using one or both hands position to avoid client injury, keep your hands steady, and the client safe. For bracing around the eyes, use the back side of your dominant hand on the client's face to steady yourself while using your fingers on the same hand to manipulate the applicator, brush, or pencil around the eye area. You may need only one hand. Sometimes the tissue is used under your hand, Many makeup artists use their opposite hand to hold their own wrist. For the eye, brace your hand just above the brow, not at the top of the forehead. To apply eyeshadow, remove the product from its container with a spatula and then use a single-use applicator or clean and disinfected brush. Apply the base eye color close to the lash on the eyelid, sweeping the color slightly upward and outward, and the color inside the outer edge of the brow. Highlighters are used under the eyebrow and on the lid. Darker colors are used in the crease. Blend to achieve the desired effect. Eyeliner application. Eyeliner accentuates the eyes. Eyeliner can be applied before or after eyeshadow. Some clients prefer eyeliner that is the same color as the lashes or mascara for the more natural look. More intense colors may be preferred to match shadow colors or seasonal color trends. As an alternative to pencils, eyeshadow used with a thin brush dipped in water works well with the wet as a wet liner. Dry shadow applied with a thin, firm brush also works. Gels and liquids are also popular. Liner is applied to the top and the bottom edge of the eye on the outside of the lashes, not the inner part of the eye. Applying it on the inner mucous membrane can be unhealthy for the eye and can lead to infections. 
Like eyeshadow application, be cautious when applying eyeliner. You must have a steady hand and be sure that your client remains still. Brace your hand gently, resting the base of your hand on a tissue against the cheek of your client. Sharpen your eyeliner pencil and wipe with a clean tissue before and after each use. If needed, also remember to clean and disinfect the sharpener after each use. All product residue, wax or wood, must be removed from the sharpener. The sharpener should then be disinfected with the disinfectant approved by your state by either immersion or wipe spray if allowed. Apply short, even strokes and gentle pressure. The most common placement is close to the lash line. For powder, shadow, liner application, scrape a small amount onto a tissue or tray and apply to the eyes with a single use applicator or clean brush. If desired, wet the brush before dipping into the color for a more intense and lasting color. Eyeshadow may be applied as eyeliner with the eyeliner brush to create a softer lined effect. Whether you are using a shadow or a pencil liner, it may be helpful to gently pull the skin taut from right below the eyebrow and out or upward without distorting the shape of the eye to ensure a smooth application. Use a light touch when working with contact lens wearers as they may be more sensitive to the application of products near their eyes. Mascara application. Dip a new single-use wand into a clean tube of mascara and apply from close to the base of the lashes out toward the tips, making sure your client is comfortable throughout the application. Bracing the hand lightly on the face allows more control. The lower or upper lashes can be coated first. Have the client look up at the ceiling when applying. Mascara to the lower lashes. Let the mascara sit for a few seconds before having them look down or to the side to apply the upper lashes. For more coverage, use a side-to-side -side motion with the wand when applying it from the base to the tip of the lashes. The end of the wand can also be used to apply more mascara to the tip of the lashes, holding the wand sideways, not pointing toward the eye. Apply mascara carefully. The most common injury with mascara application is poking the eye with the applicator. Practice applying mascara repeatedly until you feel confident enough to apply it on clients. Dispose each wand into a lined waste receptacle. Never double dip the same wand back into the mascara. Brush with a lash separator before the mascara dries to avoid clumps. Avoid using powder-based products after applying mascara, including face powder, as it can attach to the damp mascara and discolor the product. Safe mascara application for the final step after powder. Curl the lashes before applying the mascara. Of course, that depends on their lash situation. Uh, they might have fake lashes um, that you wouldn't actually um, need to apply mascara to if they have lash extensions. And if they have lifted lashes that are chemically lifted, you would not want to curl them. Sorry, that's just a side note. This keeps the lash curler clean and avoids getting mascara on the upper lid. You can practice curling artificial lashes while they're still in the tray or by applying them on a mannequin head. Ask your instructor to demonstrate before attempting to use an eyelash curler on a client or fellow student. Clients may prefer to curl their own lashes. Okay, color, eyebrow color application. Measure the brow shape and follow the shaping guidelines as closely as possible. Check the brow before beginning the service to determine if any stray hairs need to be tweezed. Usually the best starting point for the eyebrow color ranges from light brown to darker browns and from softer to richer colors. For a client with very dark brown or black hair, choose a warm black and very choose a warm black or very dark brown. For a client with pale blonde or platinum blind hair, choose a very soft taupe. For an older client with gray or silver hair, light taupe is usually best. Additionally, for a client with red hair, Taupe or dark brown works great. To determine which color is best, check the hair color using taupe for strawberry blondes and those with lighter hair color and dark browns for deep redheads. Using red for eyebrows can look artificial. To color in brows, use a sweeping motion to follow the pattern of the hair. Brace your hand just above the brow, blend back and forth inside the brow line to achieve a natural look. Lip color application. Consider your overall makeup design, evening or daytime, natural versus dramatic, etc. as you choose a lip color. Lip products are available in numerous types, colors, and finishes. I'm going to look ahead here. Okay. 
Light colors make light make lips appear larger. Dark colors make them appear smaller. Lip gloss can give a shiny, moisturized look. Lip conditioner, put on a lip moisturizer when starting the makeup application so it can soak in and moisturize before applying the liner. Lip liners are colored pencils used to line and define the lips. I'm briefly reading each one of these pinpoints here. To define a shape, to define and shape the lips, lip liner is usually applied before the lip color. Choose a lip liner that coordinates with the natural lip color or lipstick. The liner color should not be dramatically darker or brighter than the lip shade. If a darker liner is desired, fill in most of the lip with the liner and blend the lip color and lip liner to avoid harsh lines. To refine or correct the lip outline and help define the lines, use a small amount of foundation or powder on a small brush to erase and blend the lined area as necessary. Sharpen the lip liner pencil and wipe with a clean tissue before each use. Also remember to clean and disinfect the sharpener before every use. All product residue must be removed from a sharpener. This sharpener should then be disinfected with a disinfectant approved in the state by either immersion or wipe spray. Lipstick. Lip color must not be applied directly from the container unless it belongs to the client. Use a spatula to remove the lip color from the container and put it on with a disposable lip brush.